Hey fellow photographers, what did you shoot today? And maybe more importantly, what the heck does Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon have to do with photography? I mean, despite being one of the greatest albums of all time on the Billboard Top 200 charts for years and years, uh, its iconic cover art actually depicts an interesting property of light called dispersion, and this will wreak havoc if your lens is not corrected for chromatic aberration. Remember last video where we talked about the single element lens? I mean, how could you forget that video was like half an hour long? So remember I said that single element lenses are not commonly found in most lens systems or cameras because they suffer from a lot of abnormalities. They don't actually correct light and focus light to a point that makes an image that we find pleasing to the eye. Now, our eye takes care of a lot of these problems when it comes to tr transforming a three-dimensional image of the world onto a two-dimensional image plane. You know, we, the lenses have to be very precise. And unfortunately, single element lenses suffer from a lot of problems. Probably the most obvious is chromatic aberration. So what is chromatic aberration? There are actually two types of chromatic aberration. One is called longitudinal or axial on axis chromatic aberration. And the other one is called lateral or transverse, which is sort of perpendicular to the axis chromatic aberration. So let's see what these look like. So we'll start with uh, longitudinal, axial, chromatic aberration. So basically when white light or any sort of light comes in to the lens like this, and remember this lens is biconvex and it has a focal point. Let's say that focal point is about here, right? So it's trying to focus onto this point, this image plane. Different wavelengths of light actually bend differently when they interact with a different surface. So Red light is not necessarily affected as much by this lens. Green light is affected a little bit more. And blue light is affected the most on the edge of the spectrum. So here you can see we have a problem. All of these different wavelengths of light, these colors aren't focusing to the focal point. So somewhere in the yellow green range might be the optimum focus point, but Red is not being focused here, blue is not being focused here, so there's, there's a range. And because, remember, from way back in the day when we talked about the pinhole camera, these sort of points cause different circles of confusion, right? So if you can imagine the image plane itself, this here, what do these spots look like? So this green spot kind of looks something like that. This blue spot, if we continue these rays, extends a little bit further, and this red spot is like this. So instead of having three spots that all line up on top of each other, we have something like, you know, you have a little bit of green light coming in here, you got a little bit more blue light, and you have some red light. So you're gonna get a spot that isn't necessarily color resolved, all three of those colors, whatever color that that point comes from this, this image, you know, it's going to have a little bit of blur around the edges in terms of color fringing, and you're really not going to get a crisp, clean color. When you add all these together, it gets white light again, but you're not going to get pure white light. You'll get white light in the center, but you're going to have some color fringing on the outside. Now, how do we correct for this? Well, this one is a little bit easier to correct. Remember, the pinhole camera, if we make a small opening where only a little bit of light can get through at a time, and we put that you know, close to the center of the lens, then even if this lens focuses colors to different points, you can notice that that circle of confusion is much, much, much smaller. So if these lines extend, do you see how everything kind of lines up right in this range when we have a narrow aperture and we have a much smaller circle of confusion. And you thought pinhole cameras were outdated. See, they can teach you things. So this is axial chromatic aberration. Let's talk about transverse chromatic aberration. Okay, let's draw our single element problem prone chromatic aberration lens again. And this time, if we're looking at the focal plane, we're looking at light that's coming in at sort of an oblique angle, you know, and what happens is that 
We're no longer worried about the depth of focus, we're worried about these light rays focusing to the same point. So here, red light may bend like something like this, green light's gonna bend a little bit more, and blue light bends like this. Now the problem becomes that the red, the green, and the blue points don't line up to the same point. So before they were overlapping each other, right? The concentric circles were overlapping on the same point. And now they're not even on the same point on the image plane. So let's say that, you know, the camera is calibrated so that this is sort of like the central focus point. Now you're gonna have some green circle like this on your image. You're gonna have some sort of red circle and you're gonna have some sort of blue circle like this. So you're gonna get color fringing on the edges, whereas everything in this sort of area here may look color correct, you're gonna get the fringing on the edges. Now this is actually harder to correct. We can't correct by stopping down. Even if we stop down, we still have this, this, this issue because this is off axis. So that's not gonna help us as much. And it's really hard because with a single element lens, you're gonna have this problem. So what people have done is they actually try to correct these lenses towards the edges uh, by introducing different types of optics. So the reason you see multi-element lenses is something like this. So we have our single element lens. Now we're gonna add what they call an achromatic doublet. So this is one piece of glass this is usually crown glass. And then we add another piece of maybe flint glass behind it. And what happens is that this usually has an index of refraction. Here comes the math and physics again. This is an index of refraction of somewhere around, let's say 1.5. And this has something around, let's say two. And what happens is when the, when the light comes in, it's gonna start focusing it and then it gets sort of refocused again towards the normal. So, you know, this splits up into three different lines. Then what happens is this is sort of used to color correct usually the, the broad ends of the spectrum. So if this is our axis, this is our focal point. Now maybe we have something like this and this. A little bit better, a little bit more focused that way. Green may do some weird stuff and not hit the focus point completely. So what it does is it tries to bring the two ends of the visual spectrum from Remember the visual spectrum is between UV light and infrared light. So basically violet to red, or in this case, blue to red. They try and bring those ends of the spectrum closer together, closer in focus. So that's what this does. And that's an achromatic doublet. Doublet because it's two pieces of glass fused together. Well, that still leaves, leaves green as a problem. And if you really want to get really scientific and you, know, you need the most color accuracy possible, if you're using microscope lenses, you might have what, you might see a lens, lens element group uh, with the prefix APO, a, apochromatic. And that's something like our normal element here. And then we have a element like this, and then another focusing element, maybe something like, maybe this is flat in the back, but it'll be a three element lens. And what this will do is it will try and focus everything to that point made up of different glass. And you know, this is why lens diagrams get so complicated and lens manufacturers spend a lot of R&D and that's why high-end lenses are so expensive. There's a lot of research into the materials used, uh, you know, the curvatures of these lenses in order to get um, these lenses fully corrected. But let's say you don't have enough money to buy some high-end lenses or even if you have high-end lenses, you might still see this problem, especially with the color fringing, and it's gonna happen, remember, when we have transverse chromatic aberration, the effect is more pronounced at the very edges than it is in the center. The center of the image is usually always the most sharp. So, knowing that, you can take your composition with the center point you know, everything that you, that's important in focus and then you can crop in so you get less of the distortion from the outside. But let's say you wanna do some wide angle landscapes and you wanna use the full 
you want to use the full image plane to get as wide a shot as possible, you're going to have some problems out here in the edges. So what we can do is we can actually pull out the laptop and take a look at some examples. So here's a photo that I edited in a way to kind of highlight the problems with chromatic aberration. So this is not an edit that I would necessarily recommend anyone do, but this is going to highlight some of the things that we just talked about. So there's this really crappy way of doing HDR where you, you know, pull down the highlights, bring up the shadows, basically compressing the range of your file, setting a white and black point. And then I just boosted clarity, vibrance, and saturation here in Lightroom to the max. So you should never edit like this. And this photo does not look, you know, particularly pleasing. It kind of hurts your eyes to look at, but it will illustrate what happens and it's going to bring out some of the flaws and that's why you should also should not edit because over editing brings out some of the flaws in the picture or the equipment you're using so on the left is unedited on the right is disgusting but it will prove a point so because we're stopped down here f22 we're not going to see a lot of chromatic aberration of the first type we discussed the on axis we're not going to see that fringing here in the center of the lens. We're not gonna see this on this rock over here. We're not, we're not gonna see uh, the fringing that we were talked about in the first example. And that's simply because we did stop down and that sort of corrects a lot of those issues. But we are gonna see it is up here in the corners. Remember I said the edges of the picture, further away you are from the center is going to be more and more challenging. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. So here, even in the unedited version, you see a purple cast on the left side of the palm tree and a green cast on the right side of the palm tree. Now, when you apply all these crazy saturation and vibrance nonsense over here, see how exaggerated this becomes? So these are the chromatic aberrations that we talked about of the second type. So basically, these three, those three lines that I drew, those three circles are not lining up at the edge of the image and they're creating these sort of fringe, color fringing effects and not giving us the true color of, of the scene. Now, you might ask yourself, well, crap, do I have to go buy a better lens? And well, this is, you know, this is a Canon L series lens. It's a, it's a decent lens. Uh, it, it does the job really well. I use it for landscapes all the time. And, you know, to get much better than that, it's, it's hard to do. So, you know, it may not be the quality of the lens. It may just be one of its limitations and you have to go in you know, shooting a landscape knowing that. So knowing that things at the edge of your frame may be, you know, may show some chromatic aberration, may sh show some issues. But just as a quick fix, there is a neat tool in Lightroom. If we go scroll down to our lens corrections right here. So you find lens corrections on your tool panel, toolbar, and you click on color. And there's even a button. Look at this little radio button here, remove chromatic aberration. Yeah, boom. So look at that. So, you know, it does a really good job of interpreting what is actually chromatic aberration. And see that green line is pretty much gone. That magenta line has been completely, you know, sort of blurred into uh, this image. And now overall, we don't see as much of that fringing on the outskirts. Now, if that doesn't work automatically, then you can sort of go in manually and do you see how it has the purple hue and the green hue sort of bars? It's looking for the colors that you want to negate. So you can take this eyedropper and click on a part that's green. And you see how that kind of removed all the, the parts that were green. And then you can come over here and you can look at a part that has that magenta cast and you can click on that. And it's basically gonna try and neutralize it. It's gonna try and gray it out. I think the automatic uh, does a little bit of better job because you see up here, there's still a bit of green color cast. And if I click on that one, then the other one kind of comes, you know, back and you can kind of play back and forth or you can just kind of, you know, take what uh, Lightroom thinks is best and you can see that it did a pretty good job of getting rid of all that chromatic aberration. So that's a quick fix for those people who, you know, have Lightroom, maybe don't have the best lenses. You can kind of fudge it a little bit just so you get a little bit better edits. I hope that shed some light on what chromatic aberration is, how it's caused looking at the physics of light and dispersion, as well as sort of steps to take to mitigate it or you know, use software to correct it. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You don't need to have the best lenses in the world to avoid these things. But if you care about color correctness and image quality, 
better gear does usually render better pictures. But there's something to be said for you know, the sort of color effects that you can get and you can kind of play with that to your advantage. It's all about the creative process. Now I know I said that most you know, advanced lens systems have multiple elements that correct for all this stuff and you see very few cameras, if any, with single element lenses because they're so prone to all these problems. But I can think of at least one camera that does and that's the Holga. So the Holga is a film camera and it has a single element plastic lens, it's not even glass. So it just goes to show that shoot with what you got, just understand the science behind it, why you may get some sort of abnormalities or something that may not look quite right to your eye when you use this kind of equipment. You know, and then you can, once you understand the science behind it, you can kind of use that to your advantage. So I can take some fringe shots of some weird colors and, you know, and get some vignetting and all kinds of crazy stuff with really cheap gear, as long as I understand the science behind it. So go out there, shoot with what you have, respect the science, and until next time, as always, happy shooting.